Hey friends, Catherine here. Thanks for joining me here today. Today I'd like to talk about a fundamental skill for all market research and insights professionals, and that's the ability to develop and document hypotheses. We're in a field that seeks to help clients objectively understand customer attitudes and behaviors. This type of exploration requires precise thinking in order to select the right research methods and data sources. The best way to start this process, documenting hypotheses, seeing if we've got clarity around our hypotheses. You know how we always say you can't manage what you can't, can't measure? I'd say you can't design great research plans without having clear hypotheses. Well-informed, considered hypotheses are essential to ensuring a logical research process. And if I try to really precisely document my hypotheses and I'm just not happy with them, they're not precise enough, they're not clear enough, or I don't even know where to start, well, that's telling me something too. That's telling me that I need to start with a phase one of either secondary research or literature research or qualitative research. So let's talk a little bit today about how we can make sure we're doing a great job of using hypotheses. Now, I know a lot of times when people think about hypotheses in research, they think about hypotheses as something you need when you're designing a survey instrument, that is, when you're designing a questionnaire. However, I would say that going through the process of documenting and thinking clearly about our hypotheses actually helps us to choose the best methods and data sources. And again, that might also mean that I've tried to develop my hypotheses and I realize I do need that phase one. But developing hypotheses is meaningful for many different types of research, not just survey research. And even if we're just focused on quantitative research for a minute, these days, quantitative research does not always have to be synonymous with conducting surveys. Many of us now have access to multiple quantitative data sources where we can basically do quantitative analysis. We can do statistical analysis without having to actually collect data from a survey process. But first, I wanna make sure that we take a minute to just refresh on what is a hypothesis, and then we'll look at some examples. So at the highest level, many people would say, a hypothesis is an educated guess. And that's fine. Based on our past experience, based on our knowledge, we might say we have some guesses about customer attitudes and behaviors. If we want to be a little bit more academic, we can turn to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary, where they state that the definition of a hypothesis is a tentative assumption made in order to draw out and test its logical or empirical consequences. I think that's a perfectly fine definition. In reality, for me as a market research professional, a hypothesis is usually for me something that is a statement that describes the relationship between two variables. For example, I might have a hypothesis that people who own homes are more likely than those who rent to also own a car. So I'm looking at a relationship between the variable of home ownership and car ownership. Now, those of you who took statistics, this may be a little bit rusty, but of course, when we think of the word hypothesis, if you took statistics, you know about the null hypothesis, the alternative hypothesis, and so that might come to mind. So just as a little bit of a refresh for those who might be a little rusty on the null hypothesis, in statistics, one of the things we might do is we state that basically there is no relationship and we're trying to either prove or disprove the null hypothesis. So for example, in my case, I might say that my null hypothesis is that car ownership is independent of home ownership. So that's my null hypothesis. In my case, I'm trying to disprove it I'm because I think that there is a relationship. So again, a little bit of a statistics take on it, but maybe relevant to some of you. So again, the basic idea, no matter what definition you use, is that a hypothesis is something that's allowing me to very objectively figure out whether or not something is true. A good hypothesis is testable. It's something that I can measure. It's something I can check using perhaps a survey or other data sources to see whether or not the relationships are true or false. So a good hypothesis is something that I can actually prove or disprove. So let's take a look at a few examples. In market research, we sometimes state things in terms of a high level research question. And in some cases that's totally fine. However, again, I would say 
Whenever possible, I want to think precisely about my hypotheses so that not only can I design a great instrument if I need to do that, but also it does clue me in on what my methodology and data sources need to be. Let's start with a research question that's super common. Why are sales of the new widget wonder below expectations? In this case, we have a hypothesis hypothetical product that's not doing so well. We've launched the widget wonder and sales are not where we had hoped. Well, what would the hypothesis be? Well, in this case, our hypothetical hypothesis is that sales of the new widget wonder are low because it is perceived as difficult to install. Is that testable? Is that something we can figure out? You bet. Now that would probably be a case where I need to do a survey because I probably don't have an alternative data source that already tells me whether or not people find it difficult to install. The one exception might be if, is if the brand that owns the Widget Wonder has done a great job of collecting customer complaint information from their call center or via customer emails. If there's something there that I can use, perhaps I can start with that as deciding whether or not I have enough data to prove or disprove this. Um, but I have a hunch in this case, I'm probably going to need to do a survey because I'm going to want to know whether or not it's true. But that also means I need to test what other things could possibly be deterring sales of the widget wonder. Here's another example, a high level research question. How do people in its target market perceive widget wonder? So we often want to know about awareness perception. So this is a very common kind of market research question. What might a hypothesis be relevant to this research question? Here's one possible example. We have a hypothesis that the target market is more likely to perceive widget wonder as reliable than as innovative. All right, that's a hypothesis. And again, I can test that. It's perceptions its attitudes. So I am probably going to have to collect that from our target market. And in this case, I have to be sure that my data source includes both current customers and non-current customers. I can tell you from experience <clears throat> that brand perceptions that are that specific about, you know, actual aspects of the brand itself or its brand personality can vary a lot between current customers and people who are in your target market and are not your current customers. So this is a case where I may want to do a survey and I'm going to want to make sure my sample source or sources include both current customers and non-current customers. What are the most common sources of pain for people who use widgets? Maybe I'm just trying to take a broad look at the overall widget market. What are the most common sources of pain? What are the unmet needs? This is always one of my favorite projects to do personally. I love exploring unmet needs and sources of pain as a way to help organizations identify new product or service opportunities or plan a roadmap. So what would be a relevant hypothesis here? We might say, we have a hypothesis that more than 60% of widget users have challenges with installation and disposal pretty specific hypothesis. And again, it tells me something about my methodology. I may not have an existing data source that's going to tell me about their challenges. I'm probably going to have to do a survey, or if I decide that I'm going to do it on a perhaps more qualitative basis, I might do something related to social listening or mining client correspondence, again, from call center records or customer emails. Let's finish with one more example that gives us a different opportunity. Let's imagine our research, our research question is this. What customer attributes best predict likelihood to prefer a widget wonder brand widget? So what customer attributes best predict likelihood to predict a very specific brand of widget? Here's my hypothetical hypothesis in this case. We have a hypothesis that customers who value criterion X and have a high household income of at least Y are the most likely to choose a widget wonder. So let's think about this. I've got a couple things going on. I'm saying that people who are most likely to prefer the widget wonder have a specific selection criteria and a specific household income. So this is great because again, this tells me something that's going to help me to inform my methodology. I need a methodology that's going to get me both evaluation criteria and household income. So this is something that's going to help me to make sure that I'm thinking clearly about what the research process needs to be, whether or not I need to do a survey, whether or not perhaps I'm going to do a survey, but instead of asking people to 
uh, self-report their income information. Maybe I want to get the income information from a third-party data source or from maybe it's something I can depend from an in-house data source that I have. So thinking clearly about my hypotheses is telling me something about where I need to find my, my population for this research project. Now, something that's really important to mention here is that these days some organization some organizations have access to a lot of customer transaction data, and that can also come in handy too. Um, if I have a hypothesis about my customers where some of those variables already exist in my customer transaction database, fantastic. I may not need to do a survey, but if I think clearly about my selection, about my hypotheses, it's going to help me to select the right data source as well as the right methodology. By the way, I have to say that for me personally, I love when I get to participate in those brainstorming sessions to generate hypotheses at the start of a project. I've had the ability on several occasions to actually facilitate those exercises, and it's a great opportunity. So if you've, if you've never had the opportunity to facilitate a brainstorming session to generate hypotheses, I really encourage you to think about doing that maybe at the start of your next project if you're still in the planning phase. Taking that time to actually generate the hypotheses can be really exciting, especially if you've got a diverse group of people in the room. Um, if you've got people who are from different functional areas, it can be a really great way to inform your thinking and leverage the power of multiple subject matter experts. I think that's going to be it for today, folks. I hope the conversation about hypotheses got you thinking about how you can use clear, documented hypotheses to not just design great questionnaires, but to also inform your overall research design. If you found this conversation helpful, please do subscribe and please do share with colleagues. I also do want to mention that we have upcoming courses on secondary research. SP, SPSS, that's a hands-on SPSS course, and also an upcoming course on analyzing uh, open-ended question results, so manual and automatic coding of open-ended results. If you have any questions, please do post them here, and again, please do like, share, and subscribe on both YouTube and iTunes. The more subscribers I get, the longer I'll keep these conversations going. Thanks, everybody, and have a great day.